On Hope 1032, joining us, artist, singer, songwriter, Evan Craft. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. It is a real pleasure because your music is, is uh, I think, really impacting a lot of our listeners right now. Uh, you released your album, Holy Ground, last year, uh, but still it is just, I think, been the right music at the right time for so many people around the world. Tell us a little bit about the initial process of uh, curating the songs that went onto that album. Yeah, well, in 2021, we released almost four albums uh, worth of music. So we did Desesperado, which was a more of a pop album. And then we did uh, in, in English and Spanish. And so that's why I say it's uh, almost double. And then we did Holy Ground, which was more of a, a live worship uh, project. And that was really fun. Um, I got to write songs. with I, I, I write best with some of my best friends, um, a, a few a few Aussies as well. Um, but some of my best friends, you know, we got together and we were write, writing worship songs. We were writing songs just for um, real things that we're going through and things that we were feeling throughout the pandemic and, and um, you know, just d- difficult concepts that we were wrestling with. Um, there's a song called Healer uh, that for years and years, I've always wanted to see, you know, spontaneous healing, something that, um, you know, like a, what, what I would consider a miracle. And there were other things in my life that I believe that God showed me, I am healing and doing miracles in ways that you don't know. Um, and you can't, you can't see. So it was really, a um, really fun to put these songs together and write them. Um, yeah. It's good. And it's a song like, for instance, one like Healer that I think speaks to that desire so many people have to really see God do something tangibly, something so impactful in their lives. When you think about your own story from, you know, your upbringing, becoming a singer songwriter to now what you get to do, leading many around the world in, in worship and encouraging people, does any moment stand out to you as really being one where you go, that was a miracle. I saw God do something there. Yeah, well, that's part of, uh, I mean, what I'm referring to as well is that um, I was part of a bike bike ride and actually somebody from Brisbane um, ended up showing up and and we went from the coast of Chile to the coast of Argentina. And this person from Brisbane was a, was a miracle in like in the, um, in the provision. And they ended up donating almost most of the money that we had raised. We, you know, we cost a lot for us to just get 18 people from one place to the next. Mm. Um, and they donated enough money that two of the people that were on our bike ride, and this is uh, part of a larger story and documentary that I'm, I'm, uh, will be sharing very soon, but it's, it's already been on my, uh, on social media. So, mm. um, we, we invited two Venezuelan Paralympic athletes who were in car accidents and they had in motorcycle accidents, um, not of their own fault and mm. both lost their right legs. And so they were dating and they came on the ride. And, you know, again, I was telling you, I've always wanted to see, you know, some people say limbs grow, the tumors fall off, all this mm. stuff. And, and, you know, as, as a singer going to Latin America and, and, pr- you know, praying over people or something, I've, I wanted to see something. And we were able to raise money actually through someone I had never even met um, from Brisbane that, we were able to buy prosthetic legs for them. And so mm-hmm. it was at that moment that the day that we got the prosthetic legs that I, I, you know, felt in my, in my spirit um, or just inside that, that God was saying, you, you've been looking for a miracle. Here it is um, to see somebody walk again, whether it's, you know, their uh, biological leg or a mm-hmm. prosthetic. Um, it was so powerful to see a group of believers come together to achieve something um, for somebody else. So it was, it was mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't think that's that's always, you know, the miracle or something um, that has to be so uh, dramatic, but it, in, yeah. in my life that it was. And so, you know, something I'll never forget. And it also shows me that God doesn't necessarily work in a box that I want him to work in. Mm-hmm. That's, what, that's what I was aware of in that story is the way that while yes, in that circumstance, it is something that involved all these people coming together. There's a documentary around it. It is something that's relatively grand, I suppose, in a way. It also speaks to the simplicity of how God can actually do things in our lives in ways that do actually cause us to have to think outside the box. Why do we limit God to it having to be these particular kinds of ways of doing a miracle? It can actually look something a little bit more like a community getting together and changing someone's life like that. Yeah, and I think that's a real... 
uh, you know, it's a great picture or image of what the church is supposed to be. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's no promise. Uh, I mean, you know, like I, I, I want to see, you know, immediate healings, but healing, whether it happens now or it happens in six years or it happens on the other side of eternity is still a miracle, but the act of, of brothers and sisters in Christ coming together to be the hands and feet of Jesus, that is miraculous. Um, I mean, it's just the division that is within uh, humanity, you know, for us to come together and say, in the name of Jesus, we are going to help fix this one little issue. I mean, to me, that was so powerful. Mm. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think we can discredit that or, uh, you know, enough. I mean, it's just, we have to, we have to work together. And that's, that was just, you know, we, that was not our purpose either. You know, mm. we, we went in with a very different purpose and, and God said, I'm going to have my way with it. Yeah. And showing that unity is a miracle in and of itself, you know, I, I, like thinking of the way that particularly over the last couple of years, division, like you say, has been unfortunately such a hallmark in our world at times to actually be unified around something can't be discounted. Yeah. And, and that's where like, you know, I'm kind of a little theology nerd, but um, you know, I, I love the second chapter of Acts where, you know, the Holy Spirit falls and all these people from different parts of the world that, you know, it, when you read it and you don't understand the context that there's sirens and there's, you know, these other people, there are people that hate each other. There are mm. people that normally don't get along and that the Holy Spirit is bringing us together in that. And so it was, it was really cool um, to be a part of something that, you know, I, I believe that is you know, it, that is miraculous. Mm. And the concept of unity, community building, that's a huge part of the music that you write, most obviously because as someone who doesn't have Latin American heritage, you've learned the, the language, you're combining uh, the language of that culture with English speaking cultures and giving people from all kinds of different backgrounds the chance to gather together around your music. That theme of community and, and your intention for bringing people together in that way what was the birthplace of that for you in how you're approaching your role as, as a musician, as a writer? Um, well, I'm from Los Angeles and uh, Southern California is highly populated by Spanish speaking people. And I remember thinking, uh, you know, seeing people trying to fight against it and, um, you know, not to go into politics, but just so many people, you know, against or for immigration and all this mm. stuff. And I remember just thinking, like, if you can't beat them, join them. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. And I was like 15 years old and I was thinking that, but it was, it was really like, I remember also hearing over and over and over again, you know, what is the most important commandment? Love your Lord, your God, and also to love others as yourself. And so, um, you know, if I was to love my neighbor as myself living in Southern California, it was necessary for me to speak Spanish. Mm. Uh, my dad also is the founder and director of a homeless shelter in Los Angeles. And there's a homeless crisis in Los Angeles. And a lot of the guests um, have been from Central America. And so I was able to talk with them and, and hear their stories. And, you know, that's like such a central theme of uh, the gospels is that is Jesus sitting down and eating with people. And mm. so when I was able to do that with people from other places, I was able to find out, you know, there's not that much difference. Um, you know, and some of us are born in, in a certain uh, culture or situation that has an advantage. There's other people that they face enormous, uh, you know, obstacles in their lives. And so it really ends up giving you a grace and a, a, a compassion for other people. And mm. so obviously music was the natural extension of, of that. And so, you know, I mean, there is so much joy uh, in Latin America, I think that is probably the the, the marker that I've seen, you know, whether, um, you know, there are countries that have been in war, there are countries that are in poverty, they have, uh, mm. you know, dif difficult political situations. And the, um, you know, the, the thing that stands out to me always is the joy that they have and, and the joy yeah. of the Lord. So, so that's something that, you know, I think that there's a lot that people can learn from the U.S. There's a lot people can learn from Latin America. Yeah. And I, I want to choose the best thing from each uh, culture that I get to encounter. And, um, you know, that's what I think is, is the best situation for me and being able to glean things out of each one for my music. 
Mm. It has meant that your music has obviously reached a lot more people and it is doing something to cross cultural barriers, I suppose. But unfortunately, they'll, I assume there would be some people who are a little bit resistant to it thinking, hey, why is this guy who's not from here, you know, speaking our language, writing songs for us? Like, do you actually get resistance from people who, who kind of push back a little bit on your choice to do that? Or is it embraced on the whole? You know, I think that's what's so funny about the, the US and the political situation that we're in today is the, you know, I mean, Latin America is very diverse. It's very, very, very diverse. And being an American going into Latin America, I have never felt unwelcome, not one time. Um, people were very gracious when my Spanish was very bad and I was just <laughs> learning. Um, but I would say that, you know, I am, you know, I'm not Latino, but I am part of the Latino community. And mm -hmm. so they're very welcoming. And so, you know, it, it, a lot of people told me when I was first starting, be careful, they're not going to like you, all these things. But I have experienced the exact opposite when I came in and said, hey, I want to be part of what God's doing here. And, you know, that that I don't know very many other cultures, um, in, but I do know that that Latin America is extremely hospitable. And so, you know, there's dangerous parts of all every country, but I would encourage everyone to take a trip and and find the joy that I have found in, in Latin America. And, and I guess see the humanity in whatever culture it is that you're embracing, because from your experience, it sounds like we kind of can create these issues for ourselves and think that maybe tension exists where really it doesn't, that people genuinely appreciate the care that you're extending. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, that Latin America has its own issues. Um, and but people in general are I mean again they're extremely hospitable and and that's the thing is that when people you know when a when a culture leads with hey come to my house let's eat together mm -hmm. um that is very different than you know I live in the United States where it's it's hard for me to invite another American into my home um uh, it's you know we we say hey we're gonna let's hang out two to three weeks out in the future yeah. where, you know, I had a friend actually who's, who's Latino here and he said, Hey, let's hang out. And I said, do you mean like in two to three weeks, like American culture or like tomorrow <laughs> or today? And he was like, let's get lunch tomorrow. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that was the, the Latino side of, of, you know, Hey, I got time. I'll make time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I love American culture is very, you know, it, it's a lot of progress. It's a lot of, you know, pushing forward innovation. Um, but something I also have learned is that that doesn't always make you happy. Being around people and loving them and being loved. Um, you know, I have, you know, so many friends from Mexico, Colombia, mm. where they would drop everything if I said, hey, I'm in town. Yeah. And, and that's very different. And so, I, you know, there's obviously, you know, I've, I've been to Australia. I know that's probably not the culture that, that you guys are used to either, but there's just something really beautiful about, Hey, I can make time for you mm. and everything well, else will work itself out. Yeah. Hospitality is huge because I know personally, the way I was raised is that if you do say, Hey, let's catch up. I am like, okay, tell me when let's make a plan. I'm not just saying this. I don't just mean like someday, eventually I'm like, let's actually do it. But then it really does depend on the person, what they mean by it. Because if someone says to me like, Hey, you want to catch up? I'm like, yes. And I expect them to tell me when, and if they don't, I go, Oh, you kind of just met it in this general sense. You weren't saying like, let's yes. have dinner Friday night. Yeah. And that, and that's, you know, probably what I was used to growing up. Uh, but you know, this, this opposite culture of like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm here like yeah. whatever you need, um, you know, and, and there's a, there's a very popular saying in Spanish, mi casa es tu casa, my house is your house. And it's, it's for real. So, you know, my wife and I have tried to adopt that and, you know, host people and allow people to come into our, our lives and, mm -hmm. and see us for who we are. Yeah. It means so much. And those people become your real proper actual friends. And I feel like you get the, the benefit of uh, diving into a culture that has fantastic food and I know we got oh, foodies yeah. listening. Have you attempted? I mean, yes, it's stereotypical, I know, but have you attempted to make the best tacos and nachos in all of the world? Like, what actually? What are the ingredients that go into the ones that are the best you've tasted? Okay, well, my my favorite food in Mexico is tacos al pastor, which is like uh, pork tacos on the on the uh, what do they like call a, it? Like uh, a stick kind of thing. Yeah, and they shave it off, and. Um, I don't know how they make that. 
And I don't know if I need to know how they make yeah, it. Yeah, don't tell me what's in it. <laughs> but um, yeah, they definitely put pineapple on top and cilantro, a lot of cilantro, a lot of tomato, mm. avocado. Um, I mean, you can't really go that wrong after those ingredients. Um, and, and I've seen a comedian, actually, a Mexican comedian, talk about how all their food is the same, just like in different orders. It's like <laughs> tortilla, beans, rice, um, you know, tomato, salsa, and you know, there you go, or cheese. But um, yeah, I, I, I've, I can make some very Americanized tacos and they're good. <laughs> they're good. But my neighbor's yeah. Mexican. And if I told him that these were tacos, he would probably be uh, appalled. Yeah. Very disappointed. <laughs> but, but, okay. Speaking of that, I got home one day and he was outside grilling and at 10 PM and he was like, Hey, I made tacos if you want some. <laughs> and that was, that was, you know, so cool for me. Yeah, you um, never say no to a free taco, especially oh, yes. from a Mexican. Yes. <laughs> but you, you, as you, you know, you were mentioning as a family, you wanting to create this kind of culture within your own household. It's very hospitable, very inviting. You only met your wife probably about two years ago or so, right? Or got married relatively recently. Yeah, yeah. So how, how have you guys, what have you guys done as a new unit with also a little one to establish this? Oh, you know, we don't have a kid. We don't have any we kids don't yet. yet? Oh, we have sorry. a dog. You have a dog. You, <laughs> have, have, you have a pet have a baby. Dog. <laughs> well, well, tell, um, me, tell me then how you guys as a couple have, you know, sought to establish like the rhythms of your life together. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I travel quite frequently and, and my wife works part time. Um, she's a, a therapist for adoptive families. And so that's amazing. I love what she does. Um, but we, we actually went to Mexico City two, two weeks ago. Um, and it was amazing because, you know, that she has a huge heart for Mexico. We actually met through Mazatlan, Mexico, where she was working and doing um, work in children's homes for four years. And so there was a really great connection for us. I mean, I knew I needed to, to be with somebody who was bilingual, who had a passion for Latin America. Um, and so, you know, we go to a small group where it's a, a American couple and a Venezuelan couple. Um, and, you know, so the, or, uh, sorry, American Venezuelan couple. Um, and so it's really cool because we're, we're surrounded. I mean, we had four, no, five Venezuelans over the other day. There's a lot of Venezuelans in Nashville. Um, and, and we've been just been able to, you know, that's something that's so, uh, we, honestly, we get a, we get along with them better than anybody else, and so that's what's been. You know, we we go to a Spanish church, um, and and our whole life is built around that because of the community and the health that that has come with that for us. Mm. Yeah, and it's 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 very special the way you guys have done that together. And from what I've heard you share previously, it was a bit of a wait for you to meet. You were like, "Am I gonna find a wife?" I mean, speak to the singles right now who are kind of in that yeah. position. And it, Okay, well, I'll say it definitely wasn't for a lack of trying, um, you know, I mean, definitely respectfully, respectfully, but, yeah. you know, I think it, people would tell me, like, you just got to wait on the Lord, and I would quote to them whatever verse it was, it said, he who finds a wife finds a good thing, um, and so, you know, I, I really, I was, especially during COVID, I thought, I'm never going to find someone, I'm never going to meet anybody ever again, mm. um, you know, but that obviously wasn't true. I think, <laughs> Thank goodness. You know, it's a, uh, it's, it's definitely that balance. I mean, you gotta, you have to put yourself out there. Love is a risk. Um, it's also, you know, guard your heart above everything else. And that's a, uh, that was, you know, I think what my wife and I did and, and at the right moment, um, you know, we, we came together. Yeah. Do you feel like the church can make it? Ch I mean, I don't want to dive necessarily into the theology of singleness and relationships, but do you feel like the church can make it a little bit difficult for singles to find each other like in from the experience you've had do you feel like there's things we can be doing better around that part of of, of our lives I mean I had an interesting case because I was a pretty well-known single person in traveling around Latin America and people were always trying to set me up with others um but yeah I do think it is it, I I remember how you know especially because I wasn't very well known in the U.S. And so I would come home and, and I was like, I'll never meet, I would never marry an American. And I ended up marrying an American, um, you know, because I, I never even came across Americans with my same uh, interests. And, um, you know, but so I think, I don't know how the church would do it. I'm not a pastor. And so I don't know what the, the correct form is, but, um, you know, I, th I think that 
uh, you know, obviously serving um, in, in some ministry is, is a great way to meet people. I think while you're, I, I do, th- I do say for a lot of those in their twenties, I took advantage of my twenties knowing I have time. Hmm. I like, I, I didn't have to get married at 20 years old. There's, I have, there's nothing wrong with that. It's amazing. But I used my twenties to really build my career and my purpose and my ministry. And that was an amazing thing for me. There were moments of loneliness and, and we always, we always look forward and think things will never happen. We look back and it's like, oh my gosh, that made amazing sense. God is good. Um, And so I wish I just would have had the patience instead of sometimes moping at night being like, I'm going to die here for like alone, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you know, we've, been there. we've all been there. Yes. We've all, we've all been there and, and our parents probably get so tired of it. Uh, friends get tired of it. And then you meet somebody and it's your whole life changes. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, th- I know that there's people that, that, that takes a long time or maybe it doesn't happen. And so I, you know, I think there's, um, you know, just as a church to, to find value in those people and, and encourage them and come around them and love them is really important. Mm, and who you are in your, you know, when you're 20 is very different from who you are when you're 30. So sometimes it is like, it's, it's all timing and it's all about like the character development that kind of happens in that, that sort of window, I guess. Yeah. I, you know, I don't think my wife would have liked me when I was in my early twenties. <laughs> I didn't, you know, looking back, I, I don't know how any, very many people did. I think there was a great amount of character development that needed to happen um and so I'm very grateful for that yeah and I think the the amazing thing uh, about someone like you who does get to share your story with so many people is that you offer encouragement to others whether it's through hearing what you have to say whether it's through the music that you write and especially a single that we have had on quite a you know great rotation lately is one called be all right Tell us a little bit about, about that song, its origin, and and kind of the impact I suppose it's had on your career so far. Well, I'm extremely grateful for that song. Um, and not just because of the success it's had. I mean, it's, you know, it's amazing. I never thought my music would actually play in Australia or anything. But the song started out in Spanish. And we wrote it with a Dominican um, or hip-hop artist named Redimidos. And I've worked with him for years in Spanish and I drove to his house in Atlanta with my producer and we wrote a song in the morning and then we went to Chick-fil-A, which if you've never been in the (laughs) U.S., it's an amazing (laughs) God-breathed fast food place. Um, It's it's probably the only one that like people actually are like, it's still, it's, it's the best. Mm. Um, But so we went, we went out to eat. And while we're eating, he tells me, have you, you know, we're talking about the, you know, this, the depression and anxiety that has been growing, you know, kind of like a wave over the, the youth of Latin America. And so, you know, he and I would do a lot of youth conferences together. And so we've been able to see, you know, just the, the difference in even just 10 years um, of how, how the, the youth was. And so he said, I just want to sing a song that's, that says, Todo va a estar bien. everything will be all right. And I was mm-hmm. like, okay, sounds good to me. I mean, whatever, you, whatever you want to write. So we go back to his house. Um, you know, we had been writing for hours and hours, you know, four or five hours for the first song. And I go into the room and start playing the guitar part. And the song came out in 30 minutes. Um, it, you know, it was, it was wild. And so I, I had, we wrote the song earlier for me and that song for him. And I, I was thinking, wow, I just gave him a very, very, very good song. What, am, <laughs> what did I do? And so I go home um, COVID, you know, that was January, 2020 COVID starts and I'm sitting at home and I'm like, I need, it, it, we released a song and it just, it went crazy, you know, a hundred thousand views in an hour on his channel. And people were just so, you know, they, they were responding like, I need this. I need this right now. Thank you. And so I said, I think I need to rewrite this in English. And my brother had lost his job during COVID. Mm-hmm. All these things were happening. Everyone has their own story. And so I wrote the second bird. I wrote, you know, kind of translated, adapted the first verse chorus um but i wrote a second verse that danny goki sings yeah and i was weeping in my kitchen writing this and um you know like the the metaphor of you know i you know we everybody can say you know god's god has the whole world in his hands but yeah god do you see me right now is that like is there truth like am who am i i feel insignificant everyone, everyone is going through something right now. Do you actually see my pain? And so 
writing that song, I had no idea what was going to happen. Um, you know, Danny was so gracious to be on the song. Uh, he didn't, you know, know me very well, but I sent over a demo and he said, I'm on it. Um, and so he recorded his part. It was amazing. And, you know, it, it, it came out, the response has been incredible. Um, it is my first song to ever be on radio in English. Wow. And, um, you know, it's, but, the, but more than anything has been the stories. I've had countless people tell me it saved them, you know, that, that the, just to, to, they sing it every day. I had someone mm. tell me the other day and um, like a, a woman who lost her, her, her child. I, a, another person who got uh, a diagnosis of a tumor in their brain, another person mm. who lost a family member. And so it's, it's crazy, you know, like some of the songs you think, you know, oh, this is a hit, this is a yeah. smack. Um, <laughs> And then, and then God gives you something that's so much more purposeful. Yeah. And so I think that's, again, going back to the miracle thing, like that was in and of itself a miracle because it really took the spotlight off me and music. And it was really like just able to, you know, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. And, and that to me was so powerful is that this song, it went beyond the artist Evan Kraft or Danny Goki or, or, mm. and, and just took a life of its own yeah and you almost wrote it before the situations that it impacted had happened you know you kind of like you wrote it into what people were going to be experiencing in the future without even realizing which is just so cool yeah it, it was it was overwhelming because I mean I you know when the, when this lady told me um it, you know, it was last year that she lost her child I was signing things um you know, in Texas, we didn't have to wear masks or whatever. So yeah. I, you know, we did a concert and she told me and I just hugged her and I, you know, I just, I just hugged her and I, and, and I was like, I don't, you know, I don't know if this is okay or whatever, but mm -hmm. like, you know, if someone is in pain, all of the rules, all of whatever, I just like, you need to be embraced. Yeah. But, and, 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 you know, and, and that was, it's so powerful because I, I took a, a, a theology class in 2019 where I believe a lot of the, the songs from my album Desesperado kind of came out of this, um, these classes. And one of them was about suffering and how the church tries to explain away things and say everything happens for a reason, everything, whatever. And, you know, there's not always a good reason and there's not always a rationale behind why things happen. Mm. And so you know, and even saying todo va a ser bien, everything will be all right. I mean, the really what it is 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 God. If if you're with me, it's okay, I'll be all right. But yeah. if you're not here, I I I can't last it another day. Um, and so I think the song really came out of that, where where the, prof the professor was talking about how you know the church needs to learn to just sit in the uncomfortable suffering. Mm. And it, it's, it makes me squirm. It makes me, you know, but, but that's what it takes to just really love somebody in those moments. Mm. And I think you make a really important point there that the being okay, the being all right, comes from the fact that God's presence is with us, not necessarily that our circumstance shifts or change changes, but that we actually have him with us through it, which I think is really special. And it's been an absolute privilege to chat to you, Evan, so value your music and so value your time. So thank you for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much. 